I'd like to call to order our regular city council meeting for Monday, October 7th. Please join me for the flag salute. Roll call, please. Councilmember Losey? Here. Councilmember Mobley? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Here. Mayor Trent? Here. Okay, our first item of uh, our first item, we have presentations and proclamations. The first one is a proclamation for domestic violence awareness month. And Mike is gonna read this one. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month for October 2024. Whereas October is annually recognized as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, whereas progress continues to be made toward violence, prevention, domestic and intimate partner violence remains a serious issue affecting all people, regardless of age, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, Soci socioeconomic status, literacy, literacy, sexuality, ability, religion, culture, and immigration status. Whereas domestic and intimate partner violence survivors are deprived of dignity, security, and autonomy with the systematic use of control and power through physical, emotional, sexual, psychological, and economic abuse. Whereas children exposed to domestic violence can experience long-term consequences, including difficulty at school, substance abuse, behavioral problems in adolescence, and serious adult health problems. Whereas Humboldt Domestic Violence Services, HDVS, has been serving Humboldt County since 1977 to continuously support all those living or escaping abuse. Whereas all survivors deserve accessibility or access to culturally responsive prevention programs and services to increase their safety and self-sufficiency. HGVS enlists a diverse array of allies, agencies, and community members in supporting survivors of domestic and intimate partner violence. Whereas only together can we change the health and safety of our community by challenging the societal norms that perpetuate violence. Now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Fortuna recognizes the month of October 2024 to be Domestic Violence Awareness Month. The Council celebrates HDVS's 47 years of effort to improve community safety by breaking the cycle of domestic and intimate partner violence. Signed the day, 7th day of October 2024 at the City of Fortuna in the state of California. Signed by Tammy Trent, Mayor of Fortuna. And Ray is going to accept this. I may say a few words. Yes. First of all, I want to thank council staff for preparing this proclamation. Um, it's only through this, these types of events that we're able to get the word out who we are and what we do and how we might be able to intervene and help families that are, that are experiencing domestic violence. The greatest gift that we can give to families and women uh, uh, fleeing domestic violence is hope. We provide this through individual counseling, services, and advocacy. Our staff empowers people to move from a point of confusion as they leave their potentially life-threatening environment to a point where they can see stability and safety in their future. HDVS can only be successful with events such as this where we share with the community, for those folks at home that are watching and in here today, who we are and what we do. If you are experiencing domestic violence or you know someone who is, we have a 24-7 uh, hotline. The number is 707-443-6042.
if you just want to have a question or if indeed you want to check out services, whatever, please feel free to give us a call. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is introduction of new accounting technician. All right, well, good evening, uh, Council. So it is my pleasure to introduce our new accounting technician, Sierra. Um, this position is the first point of contact for finance and City Hall, and so customer service is an important aspect of that. And Sierra comes to the city having over seven years of experience uh, in customer service, most recently working for Umco Bank, uh, where she worked her way up and performed just about everything that you can at a bank. Um, Sierra is a local, having grown up here in Fortuna uh, and graduated from Fortuna High. And uh, in her free time, Sierra enjoys painting and backpacking. And so we're extremely uh, pleased to have Sierra as part of our finance team. She's already shown a willingness to just jump right into it, taking calls, payments, processing service connections, um, and working with customers on some difficult questions that even some of our seasoned, uh, seasoned employees would have a difficult time answering. So uh, with that, please uh, join me in welcoming our new accounting technician, Sierra. I'm Sierra. I'm super excited to be here. I've really, really enjoyed this job so far, really learning a lot and super excited. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Next introduction of new lead vehicle and equipment mechanic. Good evening, Council. Good evening, staff and everyone all here. I'd just uh, like to introduce you to our newest uh, lead mechanic uh, after our other mechanic had retired and in October. So our newest guy is Devin Gibney. Uh, he lives here in Fortuna, has a family, his wife, Sharice, and three children. He uh, worked in the automotive field for 20 plus years. He worked actually with the old Chevy Timberland and Ford Motors with the Tamperanis, so we go back a ways, so he's definitely local. Uh, two hobbies uh, is pretty much fishing and camp camping with his family, and so I'd like to introduce you, Devin. Come on up. Thank you, council members. I appreciate this opportunity for this employment. I really look forward to serving the city of Fortuna and in our community. So I appreciate it a lot. I'm looking forward to servicing all your vehicles and keeping them safe. So thank you. Okay. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to Fortuna. Our next is a special presentation from the chief of police employees. Thank you and good evening, Mayor Trent and Honorable City Council. Uh, it is both an honor and a privilege to be here tonight to publicly uh, celebrate again uh, just some awesome accomplishments in the area of law enforcement for the Fortuna Police Department. And before I get started, I would just like to acknowledge staff and members of the public in attendance today. Uh, Brian Taylor's family who uh, I met during my first year as chief over here is um, just really a treasure here in the Eel River Valley. Uh, his mom is quite the dancer, I can attest. <laughs> and, um, you know, just, just a phenomenal family uh, from his sister, Kim, who's here. And I also got the opportunity to meet some of uh, his relatives that are actually here visiting. So this worked out to be a great time for the whole family to kind of celebrate uh, some of Brian's successes. Uh, some of them are from as far away from as, as Florida, where uh, devastation has taken hold. So we're happy to have him with us tonight. Also is John Geyer and his wife. Um, and so I'm just uh, really happy that we could all be here to celebrate. So as I said, it's a privilege and an honor uh, to publicly celebrate uh, the outstanding work of uh, these two officers tonight. Uh, First, I have the honor of presenting Detective Brian Taylor with the department's medal for distinguished service. His exceptional work and dedication to what can only be described as an impressive investigation I reflect his commitment to safety and or his commitment to the safety of our community. 
On June 18th, 2024, at approximately one in the afternoon, Detective Taylor was patrolling the 1600 block of Meadowlark Court here in Fortuna. He was looking for a felony wanted subject who had an active warrant for kidnapping. The area check quickly escalated, as it usually does with him, into a much larger investigation in which Taylor uncovered a chop shop or storage area for stolen vehicles, which we now believe was connected to an organized crime element. Through meticulous work, Detective Taylor determined that the scene was being used to store multiple stolen vehicles. In total, three stolen vehicles were immediately recovered, each with high value and traceable links to other thefts in the region. The total recovery amount uh, for those vehicles was estimated at just under $200,000. So that's a huge recovery uh, for one case. The primary suspect in the case, Daniel Ray Fiddler, uh, is not just a local offender, but a career criminal. We believe he had connections to organized crime. Uh, we believe his operation included complex arrangements for the sale and distribution of stolen vehicles, drugs, and firearms. As this investigation progressed, Fiddler was believed to be armed and dangerous and made threats of suicide by cop, increasing the risk for both law enforcement and the public. Taylor's efforts have no doubt made our community safer and exemplify the core values of the Fortuna Police Department. His tenacity, dedication, and strategic approach are a credit to the Fortuna Police Department and the law enforcement profession. It is with great pride that I present Detective Brian Taylor with a medal for distinguished service for his outstanding contributions to this investigation in our community. Also this evening, as a part of that ongoing investigation, this evening it is my privilege to present both Officer Bryce Sancho and John Geyer with the Medal of Merit for their bravery, decisive actions, and professionalism in the appreh apprehension of Daniel Fiddler. Unfortunately, Officer Sancho could not be with us tonight. Uh, we'll celebrate and confer his medal at a different time. He is currently in Riverside attending uh, training for the Honor Guard. So uh, a few days later on June 30th at approximately 4.30 in the afternoon, Officer Sancho observed Fiddler, a suspect wanted for the aforementioned investigation, operating a red BMW on Ronerville Road. Despite attempts to conduct an enforcement stop, Fiddler chose to flee, leading officers on a high-speed pursuit that stretched from Fortuna to Carlotta. During the chase, the vehicle reached speeds of over 90 miles an hour on the highway. He demonstrated a wanton disregard for the safety of our community and placed these officers in harm's way. The pursuit covered several miles, moving through populated areas in Fortuna, Hydesville, and eventually ending off Highway 36 near Carlotta. Throughout the pursuit, both officers exhibited extraordinary skill and, and composure, deploying spike strips that successfully disabled one of Fiddler's tires, ultimately forcing him to stop his vehicle on the river bar. Fiddler attempted to flee on foot, but the officers acted swiftly, apprehending him without further incident and ensuring a safe conclusion to the pursuit. It is with great honor that I present the Medal of Merit to Officer Bryce Sancho and John Geyer. Thank you. It's so nice to have such good officers in our department. Our next item is Humboldt Regional Climate Action Plan. Good evening. Mayor Trent and honorable council members, I'm Sherry Mead, your community development director. I wanna to introduce tonight John Ford from the county of Humboldt who is leading a monumental effort actually to 
bring um, the seven incorporated cities, Redwood Coast Energy Authority, and Humboldt County Association of Governments into a regional action, regional climate action plan to reduce countywide greenhouse gas emissions pursuant to state adopted targets. This is no easy feat, um, and it's been a lot of work. There have been multiple iterations of the plan. I'm sure uh, John will get into some of that in the background. Um, but I really want to thank him for presenting the item. It isn't a county item, it's all of us, all of the jurisdictions. He and um, the other jurisdictions are um, presenting before their councils and other review authorities to get feedback on the item. Um, so we just look forward to you reviewing this, um, receiving the presentation and giving us any initial feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Trent, members of the council and staff. John Ford, as mentioned with the County of Humboldt and really representing a much more regional effort than uh, just a, any county effort. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of walk through a bit of the background, walk through a bit of what's going on and what the uh, proposal is, uh, where we are and receive any comments that you might have. If we could go to the next slide. You might recall that uh, the county and the cities did develop an initial draft cap um, based upon a working group that was formed dating back to 2019. Uh, that was produced in 2022 and it's really hard to read that uh, chart up there but one of the things that chart shows is that it, the original draft that was produced was made each city and the county responsible for their own emissions. That's going to be a key change within the uh, draft that I'm going to explain in just a minute. And what that really did is the big blue area that's there, the lighter blue, uh, represented the, uh, the county. So the county had the, the bigger share. And then the kind of the darker blue at about uh, 5 o'clock on that chart would be representative of the city of Fortuna. So one of the things that we got to with, when we started preparing the EIR is we realized that the cap that was prepared, the way it was prepared, was highly aspirational, but really couldn't be achieved. The measures that were included in it were a little bit above what was reasonable. And so we needed to regroup and go about trying to find a way to uh, achieve a qualified cap with measures that could be achieved, if we could go to the next slide. And so what we did is we modified the contract with our EIR consultant, Rincon, who also works on climate action plans. And uh, they put together a proposal, and that was back in October of 23, with a proposed completion date of 2024. And so they, they did that, they provided us the uh, the draft, and if we could go to the next slide. And it's really looking at things a little bit differently. And one of the things that this Regional Climate Action Plan does is it looks at the county as a whole. Rather than assigning a responsibility to each of the cities, assigning responsibility to the county, it uh, really is intended upon creating a, a Regional Climate Committee and what that Regional Climate Committee would do is that it would work to achieve the greenhouse reductions on a countywide basis. When, and when I say county, I don't mean the unincorporated area. I mean all of us together within the county as a whole. And so it looked at the inventory as a whole. So one of the things that you start to see is our biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions is related to uh, emissions from transportation. That's the big blue area that goes all the way from about 12 o'clock uh, back around to about 8 o'clock. The next one is heating buildings through the use of uh, natural gas and then off-road vehicle um, uh, emissions. One of the things that's interesting that may surprise you about that chart is that it shows a very small amount of emissions that actually come from uh, building electricity usage. And part of the reason for that comes from the JPA that we've got with the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, who already acquires a large amount of the electricity that we buy and consume 
from renewable sources. So we, we're already doing very, very well uh, with respect to that. So the um, RINCON went about identifying uh, what our existing baseline is. They used the 20, and I'll get into this more in a minute, used uh, 2022 numbers, back cast that back to 1990, and then uh, uh, built it forward using achievable goals. One of the criticisms of the original cap also was that it did not make a differentiation between the urban areas or the more urban areas and more rural areas. We can't all have the same set of criteria because we don't have the same opportunities. So this regional uh, plan attempts to make that distinction. If we can go to the next slide. One of the things that we do need to do is achieve a 40% uh, reduction below the 1990 emissions by the year 2030. And then we also need to achieve an 85% reduction or what's called net zero by 2045. The uh, table in front of you shows in the dash line on top what the 1990 baseline looked like. And then going down to the next, the light blue line there, you see that that line is representing business as usual, just assuming that only the state um, initiatives are put into place. And, and so that's what, if we did nothing, that's where we would get to, but we would not achieve the 40% reduction by 2030 or the net zero by 2045. That's the lower line. So basically what we've got to do as a region is reduce our emissions, our CO2 emissions by in 2020, in 2030 by 218,000 uh, metric tons, and then by 1.2 million metric tons by 2045. And I, those are numbers that may or may not make sense. If we can go to the next slide. The way this is done is that there are strategies that are created, and th then those uh, uh, translate into goals and then specific actions. The specific actions are things that the communities will do that will actually translate into reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, those are the really important things. Um, there are some other things that are, are within that though, including starting to take advantage of the fact that Humboldt County really is a carbon sink. We live in the midst of a rainforest. And so that forest observe, absorbs far more carbon than we emit. The struggle is, is the state has not found a way yet to give us credit for that. So part of the uh, first set of priorities that we need to be working on in order to accomplish the 2020, 2045 goals is making sure that we're able to speak to the state, get credit for the carbon that's absorbed by this community. If we can go to the next slide. So the areas of focus will be on continuing to enhance the use of renewable energy, uh, be continuing to electrify uh, buildings, um, focusing on making sure that our organic waste streams are pulled out of the normal waste stream, that's SB 1383, uh, which you're probably already struggling with, I know the county is, uh, uh, focusing on reducing vehicle miles traveled, and then you see the last one there is focusing on sequestration, and that really is beginning to take credit for something that this community already has. You can go to the next slide. So the, the highest priority is to form this regional climate committee, and the regional climate committee is to be made up of elected officials of the, all cities, the county, uh, leadership of HTA, HWMA, RCEA, and, and so take advantage of all the expertise and all, all of that that's there. One of the growing uh, thoughts is that perhaps rather than creating a new J, JPA, that an existing one could be utilized. And one that's existing is the Humboldt Area Council of Governments, and the Humboldt Area Council of Governments is already voted to begin to explore whether or not they could absorb this within their, their uh, existing uh, workload. And so it, there is some movement to move in that direction. Why a regional approach though? That becomes part of the question. Shouldn't we all just be responsible for doing our own thing and can't some people maybe slack a little bit while others work harder under a regional approach? 
Um, the expectation is, is that we'll all continue to work together. There may be things that individually we all need to adopt. There are some ordinances called out in there that each city would need to adopt, the county would need to adopt, that everybody would implement. But there's also something very critical about a regional approach that shouldn't be overlooked, and that is the fact that increasingly state, federal, even private grantors, people who are interested in giving money to causes, are increasingly looking for collaboration and partnership between people who are asking for the grants. So one of the things that this does is it puts us right in line, right in that wheelhouse of being able to apply for grants and we're already collaborative. We're collaborative by design. And it puts us in a much better place to achieve that funding. When you look at the number of items that are included there, there's a long list. And at first, it's overwhelming. We could never do all that. We could never afford all that. Two things to that. Number one is that a lot of those are already been, have already been initiated. That list came out of interviews with local agencies, with the uh, local JPAs that are already doing much of that. And, and number two is that it really does need to be done through, through grant funding. Particularly with the county, you've probably read in the paper our, our budget circumstances. I don't want to make too much light of that. But, you know, certainly the county can't afford to go and do all that work. We don't expect Fortuna to do all that work. But together, acquiring grant funding, we can do it together. That becomes the importance of the program manager working in collaboration with the uh, Regional Climate Committee to achieve those things. If we can go to the next uh, slide. So we've currently come to the end of our, our public review period of the Regional Climate Action Plan document itself. We're here tonight really to get your, your comments. It's a little bit after the date that's on the screen, but that's okay. We uh, are very interested in, in working with you to make sure we're capturing your thoughts on that. Uh, we are going to take all the comments and take those back to the Board of Supervisors. They've asked to see what all the comments represent from the public, from the cities, uh, one final time on October 22nd. Then that uh, document with all the public comments and all the agency comments will become the project that the EIR will evalu evaluate. The uh, notice of preparation period has already ended on the, uh, the NOP for the, the EIR. It's the EIR preparation is underway, and uh, we expect that to be released in the spring of 2025 with adoption around the middle of next year by June of 2025. That is the Reader's Digest con condensed version of this whole thing. I wanted to be sensitive about your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Look forward to hearing any comments that you may have. Thank you. Any questions from Council? I have some questions and some comments. John, thank you for uh, being here tonight and going through this. Um, this thing has seemed to, since 2019, just gotten more and more complicated. Um, we started out with each entity in Humboldt County responsible for their own uh, uh, reductions. And now we've moved to where it's a regional effort and Fortuna, basically, not alone, but with all the other agencies, become responsible for the entire county for reductions. Now, originally, um, and this is more of a statement than anything, um, industrial uh, sources were included, but, um, and I'm not really sure as to why they were eliminated, but if I understand it right, we couldn't reach those uh, um, targets if we included the industrial sources. So those were eliminated. <laughs> Actually, if I could, yes, um, just uh, respond to that. They weren't eliminated for that reason. Okay. They were eliminated as were some other things like agriculture because they're not things that we regulate. The emissions, the point source emissions are, are evaluated by CARB at the state level through the uh, 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 cap and trade program that the state puts on. So that's not something we regulate. So one of the things with the cap 
is that we shouldn't be taking, we can't, take responsibility for things we have no control over. Mm -hmm. And so all the things that we have no control over were eliminated. And, and that's the, simple, the most simple explanation. Okay, and, and the problem I have with that is that we don't control any of this. This is all, uh, um, the, the, the targets are all coming from the state as to what we have to reach. That is true. And so we don't control any of it. Um, anyway, um, let me ask you, are, w without the regional approach, would mm -hmm. there be independent agencies or separate agencies that would reach their target uh, um, reductions on their own, like such as Fortuna? I, I think Fortuna could on their own. Um, I, th I think that this gives you a slightly different opportunity to participate in something, though, because it's like rather than each city or the county having to do a measure or accomplish things every single year, the, the real objective is to keep the region on that trajectory of reducing greenhouse gases. So it may be that one year, Eureka, Arcata, accomplish something that results in a reduction in greenhouse gases. It may be the next year the county does something. It may be the next year Fortuna does something. And together, the overall result is that the greenhouse gases are being reduced. It doesn't take the responsibility away from any of us. It just means that we are better leveraged to get additional help to accomplish those things. It also means that by working together some of the things, particularly the big thing, which is the vehicle miles traveled, we can work together on. And I know that's a concern for Fortuna because you're a little bit on the outside, really, of what is the urban area of the centric of Arcata and Eureka. Um, but it may be that working with HTA, working together there are some things that can be done to just reduce vehicle miles traveled. I, I, I hope that that would be the case, and I did see where we're classified as an urban area here in Fortuna. I don't necessarily agree with that, but as you said, Eureka Arcata and McKinleyville even, that's, Correct. those are the urban areas that we have here. Um, but, and, and I don't necessarily disagree with a regional approach I do think that Fortuna could have reached our goals um, on our own. But now we're going to be asked to pay at least a portion for a program manager, from what I understand. And in addition to that, um, the mandates are such that it's difficult for our staff with what we the staff that we have to keep up on these mandates and to uh, um, you know tar get, get to the targets that we are going to need to satisfy the state mandates so it looks like we're going to have to hire at least a part-time person to come on if not full-time and hopefully that'll be taken care of by the grants that you were talking about because the city can't afford to hire somebody without that grant money. And certainly the state isn't paying for any of the mandates that they've handed down for across the board. So I'm, I'm not, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I, I hope you don't think I'm attacking you personally. Nope. I just get frustrated when the state does these kinds of things and, and expects the, the individual counties and cities to pay for it. I appreciate that. If I could offer a, another bit of things to consider here, Thanks. is that the program manager um, is best suited as something that is grant funded, and that is something that actually HCOG is looking into. Uh, that is the idea, it, not that uh, every city in the county has to come up with more money to fund that. Uh, it is intended certainly to be grant funded. I think the other thing that may help us here and, and at the staff level we've talked about this, 
is that some of the larger um, jurisdictions that may have the staff resources to prepare some of the draft ordinances and do some of those things, I know you're, you're only one t deep here in terms of community development, and that makes it really difficult. And we love working with Sherry. Uh, but, you know, we may be able to draft some of those ordinances, present those to the Regional Climate uh, Committee, and have them say, yep, we like that, and then leave it to the City Council of Fortuna whether or not you want to adopt that. And so it creates opportunities to get things done for all the jurisdictions, including the smaller jurisdictions that may not have the bandwidth to get those things done in, in a way that's more efficient and effective. That is some of the thinking behind this. And if I may add to that, um, I would also say that something about the cap that is really beneficial to look at. And if we were to try to do this on, their, on our own, I don't know that we would have the funds to do that either. But having what is called a qualified cap, which this would be, will help to streamline development um, projects in the future, eliminating their need to evaluate um, their contribution to uh, vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions potentially. So there, there are some good things. Believe me, staff understands it's very frustrating to get these constant unfunded mandates. but. Um, I really do believe that if we were to try to do this on our own and have our own cap, especially trying to get a qualified cap, would be extremely challenging. And I look at being able to really look towards um, Eureka and Arcata, who already have some of the infrastructure in place as models for us, and, and they're going to be able to be more effective, at least out the gate, with some of the, the measures that we need. Um, and I was frustrated too that we're considered urban. However, it's based on population more than isolation. Thank you. Well, John, that's, that's all uh, comments and questions. I, we do appreciate you being here and, and providing this information. And I, <clears throat> I wish um, this new committee um, the best of luck. I hope the regional approach works and that we reach those uh, targets that the state is requiring us to reach. So, thank you. Thank you. After <clears throat> listening to what Mike brought up and it starting to remind me of back in the I don't know, 2000. 15 or thereabouts with the carb diesel mandates and now we're looking ahead to the um, zero emission vehicle mandates and looking back seeing where we sold well running operating equipment that was already paid for and have it to replace it selling it for much less than its actual value because anybody in a different state or a different country knew we had to get rid of it. And now we're looking at replacing internal combustion engines, some of which had just been replaced because we had to buy tier four diesels to replace the, new, the other stuff for our pumps and equipment. And now we're gonna have to sell that and put it in with a, either a electric, you know, motor vehicles or standby uh, batteries for pumps and things like that and it's I know it's not the county it's the state but they don't really think far enough ahead and at that time back in the diesel days they always talked about the grants that were available but small agencies never qualified for a grant all the money was like transportation dollars going to the bigger metropolitan areas and I don't see a happy ending in sight on this one right now either. So that's, I just wanted to bring that up because it is a reality. Appreciate that, thank you. Just one other comment. You're, you're brave to take this on. <laughs> Have you gone to the other um, cities and? I've, I've gone to a couple other cities. Some of the other ones uh, didn't, uh, went without our uh, presence and had conversations. 
Um, I have been to HCOG. I, uh, uh, there's another city I was just at the other night. It's one of those days that ends in Y that, that's starting <laughs> to run together. But uh, so, and, and I appreciate, I, I know some of what is being presented here is, seems really fanciful. I, I, I totally understand that. And I, I appreciate your honest comments uh, because really we do have to have an honest dialogue about this and make it work for the entire community and for everybody. We, you know, the last thing we want to do is see people put at a disadvantage to continue to business in Humboldt County, um, the region. Again, uh, we, we, we don't want that. I was going to say you must have drawn the short straw, but I do know that you know um, you're probably one of the most um, up to date and um, you know educated on this particular subject and the regional approach. So again, we thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, thank you for your presentation, and I do agree with our community development director. It is frustrating when we have all these state mandates that are all unfunded. It's hard for smaller cities to come up with the fundings for those. So anyway, thank you. Mayor Trent, public comment? Oh. I, did, I didn't know we had to do public comment on this one. Sorry. Is there any comment from the public? Seeing none, we'll close public comment and move to the next item. The next presentation is SNAP presentation. Yes, thank you, Mayor Trent, Honorable Council. Uh, we are here tonight to give the final presentation on the SNAP program. Council has heard me report out on this uh, briefly uh, during my quarterly report and some other presentations that we've made. Um, however, it is something we're very proud of. It's the first of its like in the region. Uh, we think this is something that is going to serve the community of Fortuna well. And uh, I have asked Sergeant Charlton and Detective Taylor, who worked very hard on this program and the implementation of the program, to give us kind of a 30,000 foot view. So I'll turn it over to these guys. Wait just a second. Too much talking today. <laughs> <laughs> you drained the energy the right out of it. <laughs> it does. I know it sucks those batteries up. We need to get a new one. So the Fortuna Police Department will be the first agency within Humboldt County to implement this program. SNAP is designed to ensure the safety of those residents in Fortuna who are most vulnerable to emergencies, which include the elderly and those with various disabilities and special needs. Some of the benefits this program will assist first responders, which will include law enforcement, fire, and medical. Uh, in being more responsive during all types of contacts that involves someone who has been diagnosed with a special need disability. The program will help first responders identify those who may have difficulty communicating due to their disability. It will allow us to be better equipped to help people with special needs who may become lost, injured, or may just wander off from their house. It will allow us to be aware of special medical safety and behavioral concerns and will allow first responders to be aware of any accommodations that may be needed before during any of our interactions. To sign up for this program, it's simple. You're, we're gonna be probably within the next couple weeks, we'll have a tab up on the Fortuna Police Department webpage. Uh, he's gonna pass out some of the hard copies. 
So anybody that wants to uh, take part in this program can simply go to the Fortuna Police Department webpage. They can click on the link, which I believe we will have, it will be the SNAP link. The, we, do, we do request that they uh, have a physician verification form and that that be filled out by their physician. Um, and then just submit the form. It's simple. Uh, as he passed out, uh, you can kind of see some of the things that, they, that we ask they provide. One's going to be like a photograph. We'll try and require a photograph and the physician form. Anything else will be kind of, hopefully, the more they give us, the better the interaction will be, the better we'll be equipped. All this information is going to be confidential and will be held in by us and nobody other than uh, first responders will have access to that. And once they do submit this form, um, they will go into what our RIMS database in which they'll have their own profile. And in that profile, though, it'll be noted in there that they are part of the SNAP program. And then that will give us access to any of the, uh, the forms that they filled out to you know, give us any emergency contacts, personal information, and all that. We plan on publicizing this program through social media platforms such as the Fortuna Police Department webpage, the city webpage, any other social outlets. We plan on visiting schools, senior citizen uh, homes, and care facilities. Uh, we'll probably go speak with Reaching for Independence. Um, we are in the process of making flyers, which will be available here at the, at the Fortuna Police Department and or maybe the city. Uh, one of the things we thought would be a, way, a good way to get it out there is maybe put a flyer in like the water bill. Um, and then anybody that does sign up, we did design, me and the chief, did design a pretty cool decal. And so once they sign up for this program, uh, we will provide them uh, one or two decals. That way they can place that or fix that to their vehicle or their residence. That way when we do come in contact or we go to that residence, we'll see that decal and say, okay, these people are part of this, you know, the special needs program. And then we can contact our dispatch and get further assistance. And, some of the things that we might not be aware of. Um, I know this program will be successful. I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years. And throughout that 15 years, I mean, there's several times officers will get sent on a call for service for somebody that had wandered off and has dementia or whatnot. And they won't be able to provide you any information. So if we can go into this program with a photograph we could take a photograph, provide it to our dispatch. They'll be able to relay, you know, any information that would be needed at that time, where they live, their name, emergency contact, or anything of that nature. So that's where we're at. Um, we do have a few applicants already. Um, I've spoken with uh, a couple parents who have signed up their children, and I can tell you they are excited and they think this is a wonderful thing. And so. That's, that's my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? I do have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, mental health, I'm sure everyone's really familiar with my stepson um, that's had problems for a while. Mm -hmm. Are family members able to sign them up without their consent? That is a good question. Um, we would prefer the consent, yes, or some kind of documentation with some type of conservatorship or whatnot. Um, but I don't think, and Chief, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. I, d I don't know the exact answer to that, but I don't think with just you providing their name and maybe some, um, I know the medical ish, the medical records might be something that you're not able to provide us with. Um, yeah. It's a, In our situation, we, we would have been. Um, and, and fortunately, it's not an issue right now. But in our situation, yeah. we would have been able to provide the medical records. Um, that's why I was curious if, as, as an adult, mm -hmm. if we could do that for an adult child, 
you guys deal with mental health people all the time out on the street. So yeah, I know that that we're, is we're here an to, issue. it's a great point, uh, Council Member Mobley, and we're, we're here to collect information. So, I mean, if we have, uh, you know, a person or people in the community who, by gathering information that can be of assistance, we're, we're going to take that info. And then, does this, do other jurisdictions have access to the information? Anybody on our REMS database, which is everybody within Humboldt County now, I believe, other than the district attorney's office, uh, will have access to it, yes. Okay, perfect. No, I think it's a great program. I'm, I'm glad that you guys are, are putting this in place. It is a great program. Yeah, I've got a okay, go comment or a question. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a great program, and you guys deserve a lot of credit for bringing this uh, about, for being the first in the county. Um, so, uh, um, has there been or will there be outreach to the different facilities? Yes, yes, we, we plan on uh, starting to go out to schools, uh, like I said, the senior care home facilities and things of that nature. It's just starting off, so okay. we're right at the beginning of it, but yes, we do plan on yeah, going out and educating them on that. Primarily, I was thinking um, Sequoia Springs and some of the care facilities uh, dealing with the seniors, and um, th they're more apt to have, well, not necessarily more apt, but they do have walkaways that yes. happen once in a while. And they might have to have permission from their residents, but I, I would imagine they'd be happy to try and get that permission. And yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many pro benefits of for the, of this program you know i mean other than i like I said we'll have to do a little looking into digging into you know if it is an adult um and they don't want to do it i mean that's we got to protect ourselves the legal, mm -hmm. you know the legal aspect of it and stuff so but i'll I, find out that answer kind of <laughs> what i was thinking on the flip side of that is just to make um the first responders aware that this person has a mental health issue and that there could be violence or, or whatever their triggers are. So, so not only to protect the, the person that this is for, but the officers as well. Yeah, it'll just, it'll be a more positive interaction for both law enforcement and the individual. So it's gonna be really important for the reporting party when they're talking to dispatch to let them know we have, we are on the SNAP program or this person is a part of the SNAP program. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. And a lot of times too, when, when the reporting party calls. Can you talk in the mic so they can hear you on TV? A lot of times too, when the reporting party calls and they provide us with a name, our dispatcher is implementing the name into the system and once the name's entered into the system, it'll, it'll pop up. And so then the dispatcher can relay that information to us as we're responding. Do you have any comments? I think it's a great program. It's going to be so helpful for both you and the, the, the responding person. So anyway, thank you all for doing this. Now we're down to oral comments from the public. Anybody from the public that would like to speak about anything that's not on the agenda, you have three minutes and this is the time to do that. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm Cliff Clendenin, representing Clendenin Cider Works, and we just had a very successful, um, if you count a two-year fudge for the pandemic, it was the 39th annual Apple Harvest Festival and great day in Fortuna. And so I wanted to thank the city of Fortuna in many departments for helping us out. We have a tiny committee and um, we couldn't do it without uh, the general services, police department, parks and rec, and they've assisted us for decades. And uh, I think especially this year um, it was a challenging year, but um, we pulled off a great event. Um, Chamber of Commerce was involved. A lot of volunteers and businesses loaned us their time and expertise and equipment. And uh, it's, on, it's an excellent business day for Clendon and Ciderworks, but um, it's a great community day for Fortuna. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank I do you. want to say Apple Harvest was extremely successful this year. It was the biggest I've ever seen, mm -hmm. you Great. know, and, and all of it. And you can't miss going down to Clinton and getting those apple fritters. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We applaud you, Cliff. Mm -hmm. I, be I believe there was 105 vendors on Main Street this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a new record, I think. And I do have to say, you know, once again, this is another one of our events, and it takes volunteers to put these events on. Without volunteers, none of our events would happen. So thank you for every single person who volunteered and worked in this event. Okay, we'll move to our consent calendar. We have seven items on our consent calendar. Um, four of the city council minutes, um, reports of disbursements, authorization for destruction of selected finance department files, and approve proposed um, change to Public Works Department's organizational chart. Anybody like to pull any of those? Move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, consent pack calendars approved. Moving on to City Council business. Authorize, authorize the interim city manager to award a construction contract for the Main Street Gateway Project, CPI 9128, and approve the SBR. Staff report. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, see, this the idea of a northern entrance gateway project has been around for decades. City staff and citizens have talked about it since I grew up here as a kid. In 2016, city staff gained some traction with it, had a design they were putting together, and it never really materialized financially. Then later in 2023, the um, Caltrans Clean California project, which is a beautifica beautification grant program, had uh, staff applied for, for a grant for that. They got some money, but it wasn't quite enough to really pay for a good project. So it was put on the back burner again. However, late last year, Caltrans staff reached back out to the city with the second round of funding and it looked like there was going to be enough there. So um, could you get the next slide? The location of this project is the two concrete medians out there at the end of town between Sea Crane and, and uh, Ready Rent or Sunbelt Rental. Um, and since February of this year, staff have been working with Caltrans to develop a design and next slide, please, for these places. And this is what you see when you come into town without the stars. But those are the locations. And then the next slide. And that's, that's what you see going out of town. So staff and Caltrans have been working to come up with a design to, to make that a much nicer appearance. And this is what we've come up with. For the small medium, we're just going to have some cobble-looking stamped concrete. But on the larger one, that's a four-foot perimeter of stamped concrete with uh, drought-resistant shrubbery inside of that and then a, a dry creek bed surrounding like a meadow area with uh, bulbs and stuff planted. So in the spring, there will be flowers with a gateway sign in the center. Um, Let's see, next slide. Here's some examples of some of the vegetation you can expect to see in the uh, gateway median. Uh, next, please. And here's a, a rendering of something, what it will look like, which is a much more pleasing entry than what currently exists. So we always welcome uh, comments and and help from the council, but particularly on this, it's the 
the gateway sign. So this is where we originally started. There were three or four different types of ideas, but all of the staff agreed that this was the best representation of the surrounding and, and it was just our favorite to start with. So for the front of the sign, what we came up with was the next slide. And this is something where we're seeking council approval or input on, on this. Um, and also on the back side of the sign, which is the next slide, which I personally like the cursive drive safely, like on the previous one. But, but if the language, if the council likes the language, if the council has different suggestions for other language that, that could be used on the sign, we would welcome any input on that. My only thing on this is I would like, thank you for visiting first and then drive safely underneath it. J just because, you know, we're thinking that for coming to our city on their way out and want them to come back and we don't want that part to get lost. Yeah, that makes sense. But that's and that's a that's fine. an easy I mean, like I say if this is awarded mm -hmm. then it's on they're gonna start working on getting but this stuff great. together so now's the time and I did have a question who's going to maintain it is it gonna be our parks and rec or is it we're gonna ask the garden club? it will it will be the city, the city. Um, I, I believe it's gonna be streets okay. yeah the as as part of this we will be establishing a maintenance agreement with Caltrans because a portion of this gateway area is in state right away and a portion okay. is in city right away okay. um, so we will be entering a maintenance agreement and city staff um, will be taking will be taking that on with that we're of course trying to find every way we can to make it as low a maintenance feature as possible so it will be irrigated so we won't have to be watering out there um, we will have some other measures to ultimately help reduce the amount of um, maintenance we have to do but some will be necessary of course it's a, it's a great feature <clears throat> any yeah. other questions from council more of a comment than anything else i'm really glad to see this happen in uh 2011 2012 the um fortuna chamber of commerce started uh the first leadership program in Humboldt County and there were about 15 people uh, on that leadership program or in that program and I was one of those 15 and each of the leadership programs after that chose some kind of a project to um, uh, uh, enhance Fortuna whether it was beautification the sign um, down in Kenmar that was part of it just uh, um, different projects throughout Fortuna our project that we decided on was uh, um, the North Main Street enhancement. And it started out as a huge arch, um, like one in Willits or over the Main Street in Reno, Nevada, you know, something that says, welcome to Fortuna with a bunch of fish jumping. And I mean, it was huge. The idea was huge. Unfortunately, um, the money was not coming forth and then to try to get Caltrans to agree to some of this with um, overarching, you know, across the roads and that type, it, it, it ran into problems anyway. So I'm just glad to see that this is now coming forward. I, I really like the, the whole design. I like the, the, the sign and, and I, I agree with Chris. I think, um, thank you for visiting. It should be maybe bold and then drive safely. Easy, yeah. easy However, fix. But I, I love it. Awesome. Good job. So the bid opening was last Monday on September 30th. Um, we had four responsive bids with GR Sunberg Incorporated being the low bid at $330,960. Uh, GR Sunberg came in within the Clean California funding allocation, which is about 388,000, so we've got a little contingency to work with. Um, staff have confirmed that the bids received from Jira Sundberg is fully responsive and that they have active licenses and registrations. Uh, if the project is awarded, staff anticipate being in contract by mid-October with the mobilization and construction anticipated to take about four weeks and slated to be finished by December 13th. So before Christmas, we'll hopefully have a new gateway sign. Okay. Uh, 
Next slide, please. The financial impact is great for us. Um, the contract amount, 331000 with about a 57000 contingency, which is 17%. That's nice. So not to exceed contract in the amount of 387,838, the amount of the Calif <coughs> Clean California funding makes a net city fund budgetary impact of zero. Um, this project is fully funded by the Clean California program, which is grant funding that will reimburse through a cooperative agreement the city has with Caltrans. Staff are requesting the approval of a supplemental budget request to fund 350, which would bring the Clean Cal California funding into this year's but fiscal budget as both revenue and an expenditure. The available funding would cover the contract bid amount and also provide a 17% contingency during construction, as shown on the table. So. Staff recommends um, that council approve the project plans, award a construction contract, and supplementary budget request for the Main Street Gateway project to GRS Incorporated, and establish a maximum contract amount of $387,878. Madam Thank Mayor, you. after public comment, I'd love to make a motion. Okay, anybody else on the council have anything? Okay, I actually had one more thing that I left out of that. <laughs> the fish on the front, we're actually looking into getting a bracket like on the Kenmar so we can have um, your different emblems for like rodeo and, cool. and mm -hmm. apple harvest and stuff like that. I left That's that out. Great. Good idea. Okay, I'll open public comment. Anybody in the public want to comment on this item? Nobody wants to tell us how beautiful it is? <laughs> Okay, we'll close public comment. Go ahead, motion. Um, Madam Mayor, I'd move to authorize the interim city manager to award a construction contract for the Main Street Gateway project and approve a supplementary budget request for $387,838. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, move. Before we move along, if I may. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can I invite everyone? Um, council has already received an invitation. We're having a groundbreaking celebration for this project out on the site. It's October 17th at 10 a.m. Um, coffee will be served. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our next item is to consider approval of a supplementary, supplementary budget request for rollover of fiscal year 2023-24 capital outlay funds to FY 24-25. Staff report, please. Yes, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I'll be giving the staff report here, and I will be brief, but I do also want to thank uh, our General Services Superintendent, Bob Natt, who uh, helped me put this together. So, as the Council is aware, about usually every year or two, we replace one or two service vehicles in our public works fleet. We also use that as a mechanism as vehicles get older to pass it down into the general services division, into the parks division, and that's how we maintain a good working fleet for all the services that we provide in the city. Um, about 18 months ago, we targeted replacements for two vehicles, one each in our wastewater and in our utilities divisions. So we added that into the budget, last fiscal year's budget, 23-24. And we moved from there to make an order through our state contract provider, SourceWell. Um, unfortunately, coming out of COVID and the microchip shortage and one thing after the other, we weren't able to get a, uh, a procurement fulfilled on that service order that we made last year. And while we had the intent to have that rolled over as part of this year's budget, we did think we were going to make it. And it just so turns out we didn't. And that didn't get updated in the budget. So effectively, what we are asking for is a budget rollover to bring those to current so that we can procure those same vehicles. So this isn't an additional budget request until a moment from now where it'll be. Um, it's mostly a rollover so that we can procure those two vehicles and bring it in 
into this fiscal year. Um, so as promised, there is a little bit additional that we are requesting as part of that rollover in the amount of $20,000. Um, the reasoning for this is because when we sat down and we budgeted for these vehicles originally in last fiscal year's budget, that was 18 to 20 months ago. So of course, prices for vehicles have gone up. Prices for vehicle outfitting have gone up too. Um, we do outfit these vehicles with sometimes between ten and $15,000 of additional equipment, the service beds, the racks, lift gates, things of that nature. And then lastly, um, we're requesting that additional 20000 to give us a tiny bit more flexibility in ultimately being able to procure a vehicle. Uh, one of the challenges we run up against is we are always trying to deliver things as fiscally responsible as we can. Um, so we tend to try and order the very base model as it comes to um, how a vehicle is outfitted. Unfortunately, with where the manufacturers are producing vehicles right now, those aren't always readily available, and they tend to focus more on some vehicles that might have an additional package here or there, like power windows. Go figure, they still do make vehicles without power windows, by the way. Um, so the additional budget would help make sure that we can actually procure a vehicle more readily um, because we've been waiting for a long time to try and get a base model vehicle that's within that budget and you know we've been we've been out of luck we have been in contact with some dealers and we think that we'll have better luck if we have a little bit more flexibility and then we can bring those vehicles into the fleet as we intended to last year so um, with that I will say so it's a hundred sixty thousand dollar budget roll forward for unspent 23 24 fiscal year funds and then an SBR on top of that of $20,000 for the reasons that I denoted there. The funding would come from water and wastewater capital reserves, which have fund balances of 10 and five plus million dollars respectively. And I'll also note um, that these types of replacements are also generally budgeted for in our regular budgeting process and also included in our water and wastewater rate study that we recently did. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And as I noted, Bob, our general services superintendent is here and can answer them as well. So thank you. Any questions from staff? I, yeah, I um, do. From council? Mm -hmm. um, as much as I am fighting the electric vehicles, are we looking at electric vehicles when we replace these since we're going to come up on that? Yeah, so um, there's a few areas in there. So in addition to the climate action plan, one of the areas that we are being asked to move towards is um, through the Air Resources Control Board is the fleet transition. So we, as a fleet operator of more than 50 vehicles, are subject to the fleet transition plans. And maybe you're familiar with those in the, in the private sector too. Um, so in 2027 is our first compliance year, and we'll have targets each year to start replacing X percentage of new vehicles. So right now, and this is something we think about, of course, because we're moving in an area where we need to be compliant. Um, the difficulty we face right now is that the majority of our need in public works and general services is for three quarter ton heavy duty vehicles, which is not a technology that currently exists. So hopefully by the time the rural requirements kick in, which is late 2027, they'll be offering those types of uh, those types of vehicles. And we are actually working with um, Council Member Johnson is aware through HCOG, we are collectively working throughout the county to put together a fleet transition plan, um, which will help all of us as fleet operators to site charging facilities and understand our requirements and start to make vehicle replacement schedules. So, so doing this won't count against us now. We do have a need to replace these vehicles because we do have several aging ones, but we are getting into that zone, especially as the technology is made available where we will consider uh, replacing heavy duty vehicles as they become um, available. And in the short term, if we were replacing a, a non heavy duty need vehicle, we would, we would go in the, in the electric um, realm if we could. So. I, I knew that you were, <laughs> I, I had all the confidence that you were. I just like to make sure that the community knows as well that we're not just spending the money knowing we're going to have Ab to go another yeah. way in a couple of years. Absolutely. And I very much appreciate that. And, you know, I was uh, reflecting a little bit with Director Ford up here providing the climate action plan presentation. And I was like, oh, I'm doing an SBR for gas vehicles. <laughs> 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 but, you know, there's there's a there's a reason uh, we need to do what we need to do. And we'll move forward, um, you know, as, as all the opportunities present themselves in the future to, to go down and, and purchase those other things. So. Thank you. Even by 27, 
the technology may be such that electrical won't work, but they might mm -hmm. have hydrogen figured out by then. So you get more bang for the kilowatt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think especially with larger service vehicles, that's the direction they may go, dump trucks and things of that nature um, that just require more physical energy and, and quicker refueling times. So, And the other thing is, for anybody that heard the multi-million dollar reserve words, this is not general fund. This is all enterprise fund. It does not affect the general fund at all. So our, our general fund is safe and secure, locked behind our finance director's <laughs> door. <laughs> have any comments? Okay, I'd like to open it for public comment. Anybody from the public like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close public comment. I do have one question on the motion. It doesn't say anything about the additional funds. It just says, talks about rollover. Does that have to be included in this too? I, I have it to make the motion and include that. Include that? Okay. Oh, just because I figured it would need to be. Okay. That needs to be added in, correct? The $20, oh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 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 Um, I will make a motion to approve supplemental budget requests to roll over unused capital outlay funds from 2324 to be used in 2425 for vehicle purchases, with, including SBR for $20,000. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Our next item would be. to authorize the interim city manager to negotiate a contract for the 2024 storm drain lining project, resolution 2024-33. All right, um, I will be giving this staff report as well, but before I jump in, I just wanted to give a, a brief thanks to our deputy city engineer, Matt Nyberg, and our general services superintendent, Bob Natt, um, for their help in, in getting this project as far as we are today. So as the council is aware, um, the city, especially in recent years, has had issues with corrugated metal pipe failures. Um, so as much of the city was developed between the 70s and the 90s, that was also a time when corrugated metal storm drain pipes were the construction standard of the day. And unfortunately for us, um, in the type of climate we have, with the amount of water we have, and the acidity of the soils that we have, they just tend to not last very long. So. Every year, uh, we tend to get one, two, three, fifteen uh, corrugated metal pipes that fail. We find these via sinkholes in the road or on private property and other areas where they occur. So over this last year, we found a number of assets that we needed to replace that were in some key areas. And so we put together earlier this year a project to do a storm drain lining project um, at three locations, one at Third Street in front of the auction yard by the railroad tracks there, one on Elizabeth Barkus um, near, near Sunrise Court, I believe, and then one in front of the new police facility that goes from Newburgh Park to the intersection of Newburgh and Ronerville. These are all assets that, although they're failing, they're in good enough condition for us to um, do the repairs via storm drain lining. So rather than having to dig up the, the feature, um, fully with an open trench and an excavator and replace it brand new. We can actually have a contractor go in, perform some minor repairs, and then pull a new plastic sleeve through it, a PVC sleeve that cures in place, it expands to the size of the pipe as it exists, and that way you can rehabilitate a whole feature without actually digging anything up. It's a really great method um, in areas where Otherwise, you know, there's a lot of costs associated with repairing what you have to dig through, whether that's sidewalks or roads or yards or fences or, in some cases, buildings. <laughs> so uh, we put together a project, put it out to bid earlier this year, and unfortunately, we didn't receive any bids for the project. There aren't that many contractors that do this type of work. There's none locally. They all come from out of town. And unfortunately, when we reached out after not having received any bids, most of the contractors decided the inability to take on another project into their workload. Um, and we really need to get this particular project done. We have a few locations here that are, that are pretty critical to get them done. So with that, we um, did our full outreach after the bid opening. And like I said, most contractors said that they weren't 
available to perform the work. We did find one, Mixus Services, out of Sonoma County, actually, um, that has done work for us before, and they've performed the only other lining projects in Fortuna. Uh, they were just unable to bid at the time the project was advertised for bid. So with that, we did ask for a, a scope and a schedule for them to be able to complete the project as we put out to bid, which they furnished to us, and we're bringing it to the council tonight as a recommendation for a sole source contract award, which is uh, allowable under the city's procurement policy. I believe it's 2.50070D, um, which is when it's found in the public's best interest to award a contract in this manner through, via resolution. So staff believe this is um, in the public's best interest, and we're making that recommendation with the resolution that has been prepared and included <coughs> in the staff report um, in the interest of completing the project, completing it before the rains come. And I will also note to that, um, although it's not a technically a competitively bid project in this particular <coughs> case, we have reviewed the costs that were provided by the contractor, and they are very comparable with what we've paid in the past and what we've seen. And just as a, a case in point, um, so the council can also understand um, the cost and, and the approach of doing lining and how it can save some money. We recently did a, a couple of storm drain projects, and it comes out when you do service restoration to sometimes between four and five hundred dollars a foot in prevailing wage. And, and these bid prices that we got for lining are about more like four hundred dollars a foot. So um, it is ultimately more cost competitive to do as much uh, work as we're proposing to do um, to do it with this lining style. So um, if the council approves of the contract award mechanism, uh, we would instantly move towards contracting with Mixus Services. They would order the material and they're confident that they could be up here doing some of the work hopefully by the end of the month yeah. and that we can beat the rains out uh, to get it done. And even though it's a, it's a decent amount of work, if we did this in a conventional open trench setting, this is a month's worth of work um, in this type of lining project less than two weeks they should be done with no restoration work needed after that so with all three locations all three locations yep we did a location uh with mixus actually i believe it was in 2021 um also in the rancho buena vista neighborhood it was a 230 feet of 18 inch pipe that folks had to crawl into and repair the bottom and i believe it was two days for 230 feet of pipe Perfect. so yeah, it's quick and it's it's really cool. It's a it's a neat technology and it not only fixes it but it makes it structurally sound again. So if it is compromised, it's uncompromised after that. So. Perfect. Okay. Good. Any questions from council? Just a real quick one. What's the life expectancy of that? Um, it it's in line with PVC. So typically you'll see expectancies somewhere in and around. You know they'll say fifty to one hundred years or something like that. In these types of settings, you know, they they would last equally as long as an HDPE type product. So, you know, I'd say realistically, you're getting at least 100 years out of it. And corrugated metal pipe in this environment's 20 to 30, 20 to 40, if you're really lucky. So, thank you. Long enough where we don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll open public comment. Anybody from the public want to comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to adopt resolution 2024-33, read by title only, and authorize the interim city manager to negotiate a construction contract for the 2024 storm drain lining project. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Resolution 2024-33, a resolution of the city council of the city of Fortuna, authorizing the interim city manager to negotiate and execute a construction contract for the 2024 storm drain lining project. Council member Losey? Yes. Council member Mobley? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Mayor Trent? Yes. Our next <clears throat> item is to amend general plan land use diagram and rezone 0 0.81 acres of assessor's parcel number 202-0. 092-006 and 202-092-003 and 1.1 acres of 202-103-010 second reading and adoption of ordinance 
2022-771. Staff report. Good evening again, Mayor Trent and honorable council members. I am still Sherry Meads, your community development director. And tonight before you, I'm just giving a little bit of a summary. We both uh, probably recall the first reading, which was on September 16th, where I brought forward this item as two applicants who have parcels um, that they wanted to rezone for um, one to create a transition zone between a heavy industrial use and a potential future um, residential use. And then another applicant who wanted to um, install a large electrical panel for an existing shop. So in order to accomplish those zoning changes, we have to have consistency with the general plan, which required um, the general plan amendments that you see here um, tonight and in the staff report and, and the presentation on September 16th. So I don't really feel like I need to go through it again unless you would like me to, I'm very happy to, but otherwise I'm here to answer any questions and um, we do recommend that you guys approve these rezones and general plan amendments to allow the applicants to do what they would like to do on these parcels. Thank you. Any questions from council? No. Okay, I'll open public comment. Any questions from the public? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Roll call or, or motion. <laughs> <laughs> Move us along here. I'm working my way down to the motion. Okay. There we go. Well, I'd make a motion to hold the second reading and adopt ordinance 2024-771 and read by title only. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. please. Ordinance 2024-771, an ordinance of the Fortuna City Council amending the general plan use diagram from residential very low and rural residential to commercial and the rezoning from residential estates and residential single family to commercial thoroughfare. 0.81 acres of assessors parcel numbers 202-092-006, 202-092-003, and 1.1 acres of assessors parcel number 202-103-010 and finding the amendments exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Council Member Losey. Yes. Council Member Mobley. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Yes. Mayor Trent. Yes. Okay, now we'll move on to city manager's report. Good evening, Mayor Trent and council members. So we have upcoming city council meetings on October 21st at 3 p.m. We are starting early um, because of the mill site specific plan. We also have a council meeting on November 4th at 6 p.m. Then planning commission, oct the October 8th meeting has been canceled and so planning commission will meet October 22nd. The upcoming Measure E meeting is Tuesday, January 21st at 5.30 p.m. And the upcoming Rohner Community Recreation and Park District meeting is November 6th at 2.30 p.m. And then the FBID meeting is scheduled for October 22nd at 8.30 a.m. A brief update on some of my activities. I've attended my first Measure E meeting on September 17th and also attended my first Planning Commission meeting on September 24th to talk more about the mill site specific plan at that time. Myself and Public Works Director Brendan Bird have been in contact with Nora Mounts from Senator McGuire's office and John Driscoll from Congressman Huffman's office to pick their brains about how best to go about receiving funding for the in interchange projects at 12th Street and Kenmar. So we are trying and working every angle that we possibly can. And they did have some good advice for us, so we'll continue to pursue that. I have been spending a fair amount of time with Chief Day, and we both were at Noon Rotary last week and Sunrise Rotary, So, it was, and we talked about Measure P. Uh, in addition, I saw Chief Day receive a Humboldt Heroes Award on September 22nd. Uh, Councilmember Johnson was there as well. It was nice to see, lots of applause, it was great. And also Chief Day and I attended a meeting at the Bear River Band Ranch Ria to improve communication and it was, a, it was a nice introduction and I got to meet some folks that I hadn't yet met, so that was wonderful. And then I also attended the Rohner Community Recreation and Park District meeting on October 2nd where we talked about the potential community pool and then also there was a subcommittee on October 4th to discuss additional pool size options and the costs associated with those pool sizes. 
And that concludes my city manager report. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I could go on, but you probably don't want me to at 7.30 at night. <laughs> okay, our next item is future gen agenda items, and I do have a couple of them. Um, Chief Day has asked that we bring back or bring forward uh, Proposition 36 um, onto our agenda so we can publicly support this. And the other one is to maybe have an update on the MOUs for the parks. Does anybody else have anything? Oh, okay. So then we'll, let's see, I guess we'll go to our city council reports. Um, council member Losey. I'm happy to report that I have nothing to report. <laughs> oh. <laughs> council member Mobley. Um, I attended the candidate forum, the Chamber of Commerce candidate forum last Wednesday. I don't know if anyone else had an opportunity to. It is available on YouTube if you'd like to go back and, and review it and do your research on the, the candidates running. Also um, did Apple Harvest and very happy with how the city staff worked with everybody. It was so clean and it just went really smooth. I was there handing out Major P information brochures, but it, it was, everyone had a great time. The new fire station is having a open house on Ronerville Road, October 30th at 5 p.m. And it is open to anyone that would like to go there. I also just wanted to make a quick comment on Major P. The commendations that we saw tonight, this is why we need Major P in place, is so that we can continue to have the police officers, the staffing that we have, and that the city of Fortuna gets to um, take advantage of and be proud of. So do your research on that as well, and that's all I have. Okay, Council, or, by, or <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Well, uh, I had the privilege of attending the HCOG meeting this last uh, September 19th, and we did discuss the climate action plan looked at how the joint powers are working because that um, HCOG is made up of a representative from all the incorporated cities in Humboldt County as well as the county itself. And discussion was had on how that would work, how it would look, how it would be funded, and we're looking at ideas as we move forward. No decisions were made yet. But that being said, we did have a meeting. Uh, we did uh, have a proclamation for the week without driving, and that was awarded to uh, Juliana Harris, who is a member of the Social Services TAC, which has to do with transportation and how that's set up. And she received the proclamation and spoke about how being uh, blind affects her transportation and how she gets around and how she does things. So it was nice to hear that and for to get a representation of someone who actually uses transit and who is uh, has sight impaired. Moving along from that, we saw the pre presentation from uh, Planning Director Ford and how that would, we saw tonight. And uh, the interesting part, we, we got an in introduction to the last chance grade final alternative. They've made a decision we have a plan moving forward. Um, I believe that they're already getting funding for that, but it is the tunnel option that will have the least amount of impact for people using Highway 101 currently. It will have the same or uh, perhaps even less of an impact on either end. Uh, look, they were nearly similar in how they affected the uh, Vegetation, trees in that area where the tunnel entrance and exit will be. And, it, and so it was a looking and talking with the stakeholders. It seemed to be the preferred alternative and we're moving ahead. Uh, in 2031 dollars, which is when they expect it to be completed, it's, we're looking at two to two and a half billion dollars. But looking at the, I know it's crazy. Looking at 
the structure, because they presented a picture of the geological, what's happening there and why it's happening. And there's three separate earth movements in that area, not just one. And they're all moving at a different rate. And they all decide to do their thing at different times. So this is the preferred alternative. This is what's looking moving forward. And it's been worked on for a long time by the stakeholders, by the alleged, the permitting agencies, by the local and federal electeds and statewide electeds. And there's a plan. A million cubic yards of material, as well as putting it into something that we can all relate to, approximately 70,000 truckloads of material going in there. So looking at next year, hopefully by the end of 25, to have the environmental document finished and ready to circulate. On a closer note, the Bay Trail between Arcata and Eureka is slated to be completed by the end of 24. So that would be a nice thing. There are people that use that, even as crummy as that little section is in the middle now because it's under construction. There are people that use that. Um, the piling work and everything is going along on the Indianola interchange. I believe that uh, the last number I got was the total amount of piling in that area for the column supported embankment is 7,000 columns. That's a lot. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting, I'm looking for my report that I wrote notes down for, but the supplemental patrols on Highway 36 and Highway 96, uh, so 12,000 miles, I think, that they put in CHP in the month. And in that time, they wrote 56 citations. But in that same amount of time, they had 191 citizen aid call, uh, assist, citizen assist, because that's an area with little to no uh, cell phone reception. Even we're working to put satellite call boxes in there. And unfortunately, the call box company that operates the Humboldt Safe Network had, was sold to a, another company that has not had the same level of customer service. So, but we're working on it. And big doings for the Huskies. This week, they travel to uh, Victorville to play Silverado, and the junior varsity team has a bye. But next week, the junior varsity plays uh, St. Bernard's at 1130 on Saturday the 19th, and the varsity has a bye. So if you want to get your Husky football in, it's available. You just may have to travel to Victorville to see it live. And that's all I have right now. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and I did, I forgot, I did have the pleasure of driving the People Mover shuttle in the apple harvest, working with my erstwhile companion, Jeff Wilkins, also of Fortuna Kiwanis Club. And we nicknamed our shuttle the Cabbage Patch, or the Cabbage Express, the Crab Apple Express. And we had that. <laughs> I was wondering I was thinking, what, what cabbage, cabbage, cabbage have to do with anything. <laughs> I got crossed up. But the Crab Apple Express, and Jeff gave an awesome narration as we traveled through mm -hmm. Fortuna. And there was no cabbage harmed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. I also would like to congratulate Chief Day on Humboldt Heroes. Unfortunately, I was not able to be there. I was already committed to work stand down, which was over at um, the fairgrounds, and that is a veteran's um, day where they have all different types of services for veterans. It was pretty amazing to see. They bring in dental, portable dental things. They bring in everything that homeless veterans might need, any kind of mental help. 
um, serve them breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two days, do haircuts. So it was, it was pretty eye-opening to see that and to help with all those vets. So I, I really enjoyed that, but I did was sad that I did miss your award. Um, and I was also going to bring up the fire department's open house. Um, our supervisor, Bushnell, is um, sponsoring all the foods, and I'm doing all the desserts for that. So come have something to eat, a little dessert, and see the brand new police department. What time is it? Fire department. Fire department. Mm -hmm. What time is it? Five. Okay. Mm -hmm. On Friday, October 30th. And with what? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I have fr fry or fire, and I read it as fi or fi Friday. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned. Mike, um, with the tunnel, did they?